I think maybe we can we can start and other people can trickle in, you know, slowly as and when they're ready. Um, so yeah, so the well-being of healthcare workers across the globe was brought to light during the coronavirus pandemic. But the, the dangers face, uh, but the dangers to healthcare workers are not limited to the coronavirus. Like the Ebola outbreak before, and in the fight against countless other illnesses before that, such as malaria, healthcare workers have always put their lives in danger for the greater good. Unfortunately, in far too many of these cases, the caregiver became the patient. The difficulties faced by frontline healthcare workers is not limited to Africa. One study by Lapola et al. from the early stages of the pandemic in Italy found that 10% of all coronavirus cases were from healthcare workers. And even by this point, many healthcare workers had died due to their service in fighting the virus. And the statistics were skewed towards frontline workers in particular. What's important to note is that in the study, two of the recorded deaths were due to suicides by nurses due to the pressures of being on the front lines. But Africa in particular is in dire need of this discussion, not, due, not just due to the limited capacity of the healthcare system in some countries, which naturally puts a risk on the, healthcare, on the healthcare workers, but also due to the vital role healthcare workers play in African communities. As this blog post from the UN Foundation points out, many healthcare workers are responsible for educating communities and providing necessary resources, tasks which often require them to travel to remote rural areas of the country. As you can see here in the image on the slides, these are two healthcare workers providing mosquito nets to a rural community. But as Hewlett and Amola point out, this requires medical prof uh, professionals to navigate various cultural practices and norms, some of, some of which may not be particularly helpful with the people with the paper making the example of certain burial practices in particular. I think the dangers faced by African healthcare workers is best contextualized by comparing two final studies. The first looks at the mortality rates of healthcare workers in the US and finds that workers are at an above average risk of mortality. The problem, however, is even more clear when we look specifically at emergency medical services separately. The study finds that these frontline workers have nearly the same mortality rates as firefighters. The second paper, however, makes it very clear. The problem is far worse in Africa, where the paper finds that workers in sub-Saharan Africa have a higher rate of occupational exposure to infectious diseases than workers in developed countries. I'm joined today by three panelists to discuss the topic of protecting frontline healthcare workers, particularly in the African context. Firstly, Dr. Fiona Atohebwe. Dr. Atohebwe is an experienced vaccinologist and immunization expert, as well as a sexual and reproductive health specialist. She is currently the new vaccines introduction medical officer at the World Health Organization Regional Office for Africa in Brazzaville, Congo. She coordinates the World Health Organization's work in the African region to introduce new vaccines and increase uptake of underutilized vaccines. Dr. Atuhebwe is currently leading the vaccines pillar for the COVID-19 pandemic response incident management support team for the WHO in the African region. She chairs the Africa COVID-19 readiness and deployment task team composed of several organizations and partners. She previously worked with PATH, supporting vaccine introductions in Africa and Southeast Asia. She holds a bachelor's degree in medicine and surgery from Barara University in Uganda, a master's degree in international public health from the University of Leeds, United Kingdom, a postgraduate training in vaccinology from the University of Cape Town, South Africa, and project leadership and management from Cornell University, USA. Fiona is a proud survivor of severe COVID-19. Secondly, I'm joined by Mr. Umaru Bari. Umaru Bari is a Sierra Leonean Guinean American by way of Harlem, New York, and is a sixth year uh, doctor of medicine and doctor of philosophy candidate with a research interest in molecular bio microbiology and medical interests in global health and community health. Umaru has been to 36 countries and is aiming by the grace of COVID-19 to reach 50 by the time he completes his MD PhD training. And finally, Mr. Toba Odumosu. Toba Odumosu works with the National Association of Nigeria Nurses and Midwives. He is present, presently the State Secretary of the Lagos State Council. He brings robust experience from his past responsibilities, leading and participating in various public health initiatives, working with a number of non-governmental and private health organizations. Toba is passionate about healthcare development and the application of digital technology and health systems processing. He holds a bachelor's degree in nursing science from Obafemi Owolwo University in Ile Ife. 
Here are the references that I mentioned in the slides, if anyone is particularly interested. Uh, and in particular, it will be in the recording after this uh, that will go up after this discussion. So the audience, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screens to submit questions and feel free to submit those whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you to our panelists again for, for taking the time to join us. Um, I'm you know, exceptionally excited to be having this conversation and I think it will be, will be a fruitful one. I think we can kick, kick the discussion off briefly with just a, a rather broad question of um, what are some of the biggest challenges uh, faced by healthcare workers, um, in, particularly in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, I think we can maybe go in the order that I introduced the panelists for this question. So to uh, Dr. Atuhebwe, would you mind um, you know, going first? Thank you very much, uh, Devon, and uh, hello to everybody listening out there. So where there are two way, where two -way interactions between decision makers and healthcare workers during emergencies of global health security threats, the most frequent concern raised relates to the occupational hazard associated with unintended exposure to contagious agents and or delivering healthcare in conflict zones. So the World Health Organization and other development partners provide infection and pre prevention and control guidance for country programs to adapt. However, we know that in Africa, situations are very different. A perfect mirror, as you mentioned in your introduction remarks, uh, Devon, is the rate of health worker infections that we saw during the Ebola virus disease that ravaged West Africa a few years ago. And while we held ourselves for the invaluable lessons we thought that we'd learn from West Africa, where more than 300 health workers of nearly the 17,000 documented cases died of Ebola in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, here came COVID-19 pandemic that showed us that Africa was more or less never prepared for this. The lack of PPE, the lack of care, even for caregivers in most African countries, no oxygen, beds, be, no beds. We saw health workers die just because they could not get health care, the care that they provide. Even affordability of uh, the private services that they offer themselves because of the low remuneration we know for African healthcare workers. So healthcare workers are human. There's also that fear to catch the disease. And when they do, because of the experience of the, and the trauma, the, the prognosis that they know that they've seen of people who get hospitalized, the trauma of impending death or disability, where they will leave their families and all that really, really gets to them. So the challenges are multiple for healthcare workers, but I'll stop here for now. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Barry, would you mind going next? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Devin, and everyone else for the invitation to speak about this important topic. Um, so for me, I wrote two, two specific um, points. One is preparedness, and that goes into different levels. There's also communication. Um, I think these two are have shown to be the most problematic when it came to um, COVID-19. And in preparedness, there's institutional, there's national, there's also global. Institutional means what is your hospital setting, uh, whether it's public or private, doing to prepare you for things like this? Um, what are they doing today to day? Or what are the protocols that they have instituted to ensure the safety, um, ongoing safety of healthcare workers? There's also national, because we know this um, is how prepared is your nation in tackling these problems, whether it's an epidemic or a pandemic or, or anything of that sort. What is your country willing to do to make sure not only healthcare uh, workers are, are um, safeguarded, but also the, the population? And there's a global response as well, such as the World Health Organization, among others, like that provide the financial support to make sure that everything is um, equitable throughout the, throughout the world. So what are these, what are the protocols that these different places have instituted to make sure that there's safeguards to make sure that everyone gets the proper access to care? And there's communication. Like, I think this is one of the biggest and most undervalued thing that we have um, here, which is um, what is... How can the scientists and the medical professionals um, basically communicate appropriately with sciences? Because one thing we learned from COVID-19 is since, since it was something new and since the, the facts and, and the evidence kept on changing, people started doubting and mistrusting not only healthcare workers, which put them at greater risk, 
but also uh, we saw a lot of um, shifting in the data. So I think there could be a lot done to prepare the public in, in receiving information um, ahead of time, but also there could be um, you know, constant ways of understanding that that could be given to the public because this is not the first coronavirus um, uh, epidemic that has happened. Was, there was MERS, there was also SARS. So what have we learned uh, and how can we institute what we have learned to make sure that there's no gap between the community, the scientific and medical community, the healthcare workers and the general public? Great, thank you, Mr. Vari. And uh, Mr. Odomosu? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Devon. And uh, thank you for everyone for joining. Yeah, so uh, to take it up from there, I would say that uh, one of the uh, major challenges I have seen is uh, the workloads that uh, this you know, pandemic has actually brought in the system. We understand the fact that uh, many uh, African healthcare systems are already fragile. The declaration that was made in Abuja about 19 years ago now about financing healthcare uh, with as much as 15%, uh, almost very few countries have been able to meet up with that. And of course, that has left the health system itself already vulnerable before this. So of course, that has affected uh, healthcare workers in a lot of ways. Uh, for example, in Nigeria here, the uh, level of attrition of health workers has, has made uh, health workers who have stayed behind uh, having to deal with a lot more load, a lot more psychological pressure at work and all sorts. And of course, uh, the budgetary allocation, for example, in Nigeria this year, we still have something around 7%. And the out of the 7%, you see that almost 70% of that 7% is also, also going to recurrent. So you see, yeah, there's very little uh, investment in infrastructure, the key infrastructures, been able to you know, provide oxygen, provide all these key amenities that would ensure that health workers don't have to, uh, the work does not become even much more difficult. And of course, that, uh, the issue of a lot of hazards that people now face as a result of that poorly financed uh, healthcare system. And uh, maybe another issue is again, I should just add is that also the financing system of healthcare here affects health worker in a whole lot of ways that, uh, might not be familiar in other plans. Great, thank you for that. I think that as far as I can see, one of the primary maybe um, points that's come up across all three of your answers there is, you know, perhaps a lack of preparedness more in terms of aspects that are helpful for medical uh, practitioners, but not, you know, explicitly perhaps taught. For example, you've all mentioned communication and also psychological uh, preparedness. So I'd like to find out, is, is education or lack thereof to a degree to blame for some of the risks faced by healthcare workers? And then when I, you know, what I mean by this is from the side of the healthcare workers or also from the side of, of the public, should some kind of basic knowledge be, be taught to the public and how do you understand the communication from healthcare workers? Or, or how best could we actually educate the population to, to maybe make sure these sorts of problems are alleviated in the future? Um, I think maybe, Umaru, you, you spoke about this the most, so if you would maybe like to go first. Yes. Um, so I think in terms of the healthcare workers, I would say 90% no on education part. But in terms of the public, I would say um, 100% yes. Um, well, 90, I would say 90% yes in terms of the general public. Because one thing I kept on hearing from not only... Um, like the, the layperson, also individuals I've interacted with is, do you guys know what you're doing? Do you, are you sure? Is, is, is this real? And are these facts? Why you keep on changing your answers? And I think that's dwells down to the general public now understanding the process of science. You know, it's, it's science. It's, you know, it's whenever we get new evidence, something, some guidelines may change. So I think that's where the fault came in from the beginning and our elected leaders and also the people who are communicating is to the first thing that should have been done was basically say, this is a new disease, um, it's a new virus, we don't know how it works. And in the process of learning how it works, we'll make mistakes. And then also saying, hey, we made a mistake, but it wasn't really out of anything. It was just more, we needed more evidence. So I think it's trying to get the public to understand that. Even right now with everything that's going on, it's letting them know 
this is still relatively new compared to everything with the vaccines and everything else. Here's how, here's what we know. And here's what we are trying to find out. And here's what we'll do once we find out new information. And that goes both for the healthcare workers, but also for mostly for the general public, because the general public is, is, is um, I would say, like the, a lot of the burden comes to them as well uh, when it comes to um, increasing like morbidities and mortalities, uh, but also for the healthcare workers when they have to deal with patients who um, not only probably refusing vaccines, but also treatments because of the lack of understanding of how things work or also, but because of things that they hear out in the public, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and that's probably the second epidemic throughout what we have right now. Um, so I would say yes on the, on the public part and on the, on the healthcare workers, more or less. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Atahebwe, Mr. Uh, Odimosu, would you like to add to that? If I'm to add on to what Umar said, for me, undoubtedly, healthcare workers contribute significantly towards ensuring that members of the society and communities access optimal health uh, services equitably. Healthcare workers have been known to be, the, to be opinion leaders when it comes to health information. If we've seen places where, and for example, we saw it with the vaccine, where healthcare workers have said no to the vaccine, this impacts in a very negative way to the communities because the communities will always come back to the healthcare workers to seek for counsel or to, to those who are still on the edge to ask for information. So yes, the more capacitated healthcare workers are with relevant health knowledge, the better the healthcare they will provide. And empirical research has shown that on causal effects of education on health suggests that education indeed does improve health, both on the side of the healthcare workers and the communities. There are several benefits of education, of course, including the reduction of stress. They may know how to work better with it. They know how to, provided they have more information. If they are a health worker who is good at information gathering, has a higher likelihood of providing better services. Of course, risks that uh, healthcare workers face may or may not exclusively be attributed to their levels of education, given that other host and community and environmental confounders exist. The overall returns to education may best be understood when the inequalities in health and life expectancy are contextualized. So in primary healthcare, one of the core principles for quality service provision is public participation. So, an educated public inevitably participates meaningfully. If individuals are aware of the health fostering effects uh, of schooling, less investment goes into affecting public health policy. And if in individuals are unaware of the benefits, like we are seeing uh, how people really are not following the SOPs for, for the, the COVID prevention or even taking up the vaccine, the case for public health policy, then enforcement is stronger. So education that contextualizes wealth and socioeconomic environment, in particular communities, may have meaningful impact, impact on risks uh, that healthcare workers and communities uh, they serve face. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Orimasu? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so I think uh, what I believe is that uh, to, to a large extent, uh, there's a need to, if we improve the education system and the education structure for health workers, there will be some level of improvement. And of course, uh, for the public, it's, uh, there's a way we can also improve uh, science communication. But from the point of view of the public, you see that uh, there's a general uh, mistrust for government, for people who work with government. And so, of course, some of those things cascade into issues of uh, COVID-19 and pandemic. And in fact, you describe a situation where some of them uh, believe more religious leaders and political leaders and people, you know, I would exploit some of these circumstances to such end. So I think uh, uh, definitely if the communication system and infrastructure is improved, if there's investment in being able to communicate science, if people trust the government more, if they, they understand the science behind some of these things, uh, much better than the fact we see. For example, in Nigeria, 
we have uh, as at least maybe have, as of today, you only have about four percent, uh, four uh, four out of hundred in terms of vaccination rate. And of course, we speak to the level of confidence people have and trust people have in some of these things. And of course, this WhatsApp and all these platforms, the information spreads a lot faster now. And before you know it, people don't even know which uh, source to actually trust. So I think that's my opinion. Okay, thank you. I mean, I'd like to. I think just continue this um, this kind of topic for a little bit more. And I'm curious then on maybe a more actionable level, whose responsibility is it then to, you know, educate the public, which you've all kind of pointed out that the best way to protect healthcare workers is to help educate the public. Where does this, you know, responsibility lie? Is it is it in government? Can and how does maybe, you know, NGOs fit into, into this, you know, ecosystem of maybe educating the public more? Um, maybe Mr. Odomosi, would you would you like to maybe pick that up first? Yes. Uh, so I think uh, the responsibility should uh, definitely be a shared one. Yeah, the responsibilities for different institutions uh, within society to uh, you know ensure that people have uh, the right uh, information. So the government on its own part has definitely a huge. Responsibility, despite the fact that we will probably mostly um, stress government. But I think uh, some of the lessons we can take from this uh, pandemic is that, that like uh, Mr. Omar pointed out, that there's a need for some level of preparedness, even from very formative years, that people understand certain, uh, that those, some of those things are infused into it, the formal uh, educational system. So people get those information uh, even before we have this pandemic. And unfortunately, the projection is that some of these things will be with us for a long time and we'll see several cycles of it. So I think from that point of view, the government has, left there, but then we need to now look at other institutions that have uh, so much influence on the belief system and the cultural system of people within different societies. So in that way, we, we might be thinking of leveraging uh, religious education. Uh, when people uh, go to such, uh, you know, church, mocks, people where, uh, places where they are easily influenced, then there's a need to, to get to partner with such institutions to ensure that people get uh, the right information and so many other institutions across uh, the society. So I think that would be a way to spread the, 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 the job of communicating this sense uh, properly. That's my opinion. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ato Hebwe or Mr. Barry, would you like to go next? Okay, I can come next. So. Right. Indeed, as um, the former speakers mentioned, the government has a role to play uh, because most we have many government institutions, but also the education sector, whether government or private, the academia world, the academic world has a role to play because this is where healthcare workers go through for education. The employers of these healthcare workers, the health facilities and NGOs, wherever these healthcare workers. Uh, are giving their services have that role to ensure that the healthcare workers are receiving this continuous medical education. Things change. When you leave a, a medical school and get to a health facility, you, if you do not up your game, if you do not continuously follow the new trends, things change very fast because healthcare workers are very busy people. There's even no time to, to go back and, uh, and look for this information. We have professional bodies. Nurses councils, clinic officers councils, doctors councils, all these have a role to ensure that the, the people and individuals and professionals under those bodies are continuously educated. The media, healthcare workers are now on social media like any other person. Social media seems to have been the new medical school. That's how everybody is now an expert on COVID-19. So the media also has a role to put out the right information because it will still be accessed by healthcare workers. And healthcare workers being human can also take up whatever negative is there. Then the self-education. It is also our role as healthcare workers to seek the right information and give out the right information. That public, that personal uh, role that we have to play and we owe, we owe it to society to ensure we, we get this the right information to put out there. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Barry. Yeah, uh, I think it takes it takes a village um, um, with everything when it comes to this. It, it, 
I, I believe in the, the ground up approach, whether it's like the individual approach for me to my family and friends and, and people like that. Um, but also when it comes to me and my primary care provider, I trust him probably more than an institution. So, or the church and the religious institutions as have been previously mentioned. So it would take uh, just all sides coming together and figuring out how do we, how do we send out the same message? Because sometimes it's not about, it's not about the, the message itself, it's about how people send it out um, and what type of message is sent out and when it's sent out. Because as we mentioned, like the, the data changes, uh, especially for this virus, you know, mask on. Oh, no, no mask. Oh, wait, wait, mask, mask, mask. You know, like that confused a lot of people. And a lot of people became frustrated because they're like, so who's telling me what? Because then there's a lag behind the information. So we need to find an approach where the information it goes like this, whether it starts with the scientific community because they discovered the information first and it goes down towards, you know, the individual level so that everyone's passing the same information. New information comes, they're like, all right, new information is coming. Then they go again. Instead of like, oh, people saying the, the information that's like outdated, that basically sets us back because then now we're seen in the public as this, do we even know what we're saying? And that's a lot of, that, that causes a lot of rifts between communities because they're like, oh, now mask, no mask. Like it, it just hinders, I think, the, the public health awareness and just the cohesiveness of a response. Great, thank you for that. Um, I would like to actually move on to, and maybe just start with something that Dr. Otto Hepwe just said. So as far as, you know, continuous education of, of healthcare workers is concerned, that seems to fall at least larger and perhaps at the hospitals or, you know, maybe slightly higher up at kind of trade union level or something along those lines of how to keep, you know, medical professionals up to date with information. However, that does seem to be sort of the kind of thing that would maybe be skewed towards uh, more private hospitals. So the next question, and maybe leading into our next kind of direction of discussion, is how do we handle the difference between private and public hospitals, particularly when we want affordable health care, but we also want to maintain exceptionally high standards uh, to keep our workers safe. And particularly in, the, in African countries, this trade-off between you know, affordability and protecting healthcare workers seems to be, be kind of very difficult, especially at this you know, public versus private level. Um, so I'm curious how we maybe mitigate that or, or at least, you know, handle with that kind of dichotomy. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's anyone who would like to particularly go first on this topic. Well, disparities in public and private hospitals and the working environment for healthcare workers are noticeable in certain high-risk uh, departments. For example, uh, emergency departments or ICU or operating theaters, the quality of an ICU or an operating theater in a public hospital in most African places cannot be compared to a private hospital. In most government-owned healthcare facilities where working conditions are perceived to be the worst with low staff motivation, low remuneration, providing care may come with potential negative consequences to the caregiver. On the other hand, the private healthcare sector is experiencing a crisis in spiraling costs in a bid to increase uh, to keep both the healthcare worker and their clients safe. And we know that in, Af in, the, in the African public facilities, keeping the healthcare worker safe is not really a big uh, priority to most of our governments. So a health insurance regulated market may be a viable answer to addressing disparities in formal healthcare settings in low and middle income countries. In managed competition to, for healthcare, insurance plans are expected to compete based on price and quality by, selecting, um, by selectively contracting uh, with networks of hospitals uh, or physicians or other medical care providers. We've seen lessons that have emerged from uh, countries like Kenya where they show that a citizen-friendly national health insurance fund could eventually address the disparities in care and service provision in public and private facilities while still ensuring health worker safety. But again, that disparity will always remain big between private and public, especially on the African continent. Over to you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Arimosu, would you like to go next? 
Yeah. So uh, I think uh, when you talk about the spread between private and public, uh, we'll be looking at a, uh, it's a very systemic issue and that uh, it's, it comes from the, 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 the way the government decides to, to even do its own funding of healthcare system. So uh, for example, in, uh, in, this, in Nigeria where I am from, uh, many people who are from the lower class, uh, is that you want to go to a government hospital where you, you be sure that uh, healthcare there is likely to be cheaper, of course, a lot more stressful, or then you have to resort into taking uh, self-medication uh, and the likes. And then what the efforts that have been made now is to ensure that there's some sort of risk pooling system, which uh, people can contribute the bits they can to to be able to have access to healthcare. So, but that's not to say that there are, we don't you know you don't have very you know, very pricey and very uh, sophisticated uh, private hospitals. But of course, that introduces a class issue in which the people who are in the upper class are the ones who can afford uh, this kind of uh, services. You have other private hospitals that are uh, much more poorly resourced, uh, the quality of healthcare workers there, you, know, you have them employing quacks, but sometimes even putting the clients and the patient even under much more risk, despite the fact that they have to uh, spend their, their funds. So of course, that's, that lays bare the systemic issue. But, uh, and for us to be able to close that gap, I think there's a need for the government to you know, rethink what healthcare means. Is it a right? Is this something that it's every citizen has a right to, in which you have to fund at least basic healthcare? So that, that's all, it raises those kinds of questions that, that do then ensure that if uh, even uh, health workers are able to work in uh, uh, very safe conditions, depending on how the government sees healthcare, is this something that should be heavily funded or it should be left to private citizens to spend most of what happens now is usually out of pocket spend. I think uh, that's that's my own uh, opinion. Thank you. Uh, and then Mr. Barry. Yeah, I think I think for for us, um, you know, for most of us who go into medicine or healthcare, you know, we typically do it because we have a passion. But sometimes that passion is not enough for us to go through. Um, and this question of public versus private. When I think about it, I think about um, my growth as a as a future physician and my growth as a, as a provider. So what can I get out of a private setting, um, whether that private setting is um, or a public setting, or what can I get out of a country like, you know, I come from Guinea versus the U.S. So when we talk about this, then we, we, we have to talk deeper into um, not only finances, because if if I see a private hospital pays more for or has certain things and that's going to reduce my stress level um, versus a public health setting, then I'm more likely to go work in a, a hospital setting that's private um, that can help me grow into a physician that I, that I want to be. Um, that is to say, now that takes human personnel away from the public setting and that leads to less and less people working in that public setting and that causes more stress on the people that actually stay there. So, you know, as mentioned previously, you know, the government has to think about how do we make these competitive? How do we make these public settings more competitive, whether it's financial or the support? Also, one thing that, you know, that, for example, that I take for granted in my school here is, um, and this may be pertinent to healthcare workers, is I can pull up every single journal here and learn about every single little thing because there's no fees. My school takes care of all of that. Is that the same for someone who works at a medical setting or a medical center in, for example, Guinea or Sierra Leone? Can they pull up the same information or have subscriptions to up to date, which is like a, a software program where I can learn about any management setting? And because that will help me become an even better physician. So um, all of these things matter um, in not only the government, but all local government stepping in, producing the brain drain also making sure that there's a basis of care, uh, which means that there's a level which we all come together and understand that there shouldn't be anything below that, whether it's, um, whether it's preventative care, whether it's cost of surgeries, there shouldn't be anything prohibitive 
to make sure that you actually get that type of care. So I think it is, a, is an important question. And that's something that we even see here in the developed nations because um, our private hospital is not the same as the county hospital here as well. They provide different things and they um, have different bargaining power as well. Because that's one thing that we also forget is the government can bargain how much they pay, how much uh, whatever in the country pays for certain medications, um, certain um, amenities that, that they use within that country as well. So all of these things play a role in, in the improvement of care for the general public. Great, thank you everyone. Um, you know, maybe just to, to draw this kind of line of uh, this topic to a close. Um, so Dr. Otoherboy, you, you kind of mentioned the health insurance regulated markets uh, and Mr. Odomosi, you mentioned a kind of more risk pooling system, which both seem, you know, obviously quite related to me. Uh, hypothetically from, you know, maybe one day soon as perspective, one day Africa's perspective as an advocacy organization, what are the kind of biggest barriers to introducing these sorts of systems in Africa? Or, or you know, if, if one day Africa were to, to advocate for change on these fronts, what are the kind of, you know, issues we'd be overcoming? Why, why are these systems just not being generally accepted if the, the evidence is that they, they work? Uh, Mr. Ademosi, would you maybe maybe like to go first again? Yeah, so uh, I think that there, there are a lot of challenges, like the different factors that make uh, this things very difficult. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you talk about how those incentives align with different players within, uh, within, the, uh, within the industry. Uh, you look at the kind of governance structure we have, uh, the leaders, what, what's what, uh, what, what agenda do they have and what, how are they thinking about uh, some of these uh, things? And of course, you talk about some of the bureaucratic, plainly bureaucratic issues you have here. And then of course, uh, honestly, you also do not leave out the issues of uh, corruption, you know, the everyday challenges of leadership in some of, in, uh, in our climb here. So uh, when you have a system like that, that on face value, uh, anybody should subscribe to. Then you then have to look at the other underlining tones of different stakeholders and interest groups and how to balance uh, some of their own interests. Of course, that makes it a lot more cumbersome. And then some of the structural issues and process issues that we have, is, you know, sometimes you talk about lack of data, lack of uh, infrastructure on ground, uh, lack, lack of access. So there's so, so many layers of uh, problems that makes some of these uh, things not not have a, like a smooth takeoff or smooth, but these are not this is not to say that these things are not surmountable. So, for example, the organisation I work for, the professional association, also has a role to play in that sort of uh, advocacy, ensuring that the government sticks to certain things or we are able to onboard. So, I would say, for example, uh, I'm, I'm in Lagos right now, and uh, this uh, a, an insurance scheme. Has, has been just uh, has been started by the state government. So now uh, there's a lot of expectation. People have you know, they developed some of these funds from. But the problem then is that when people go to the point where they're supposed to assess care, they're not able to assess uh, the quality of care they're expecting. Of course, that already leads to distrust already. And to, you know, to get the system going becomes extremely difficult. So that, of course, speaks to a certain level of capacity and capability of those people even implementing those systems. How, much capable and uh, idea in ensuring that they can manage all these processes, all these expectations, and uh, and keep things going. So, I think those are some of the factors I can list uh, for now. Thank you for that, um, Doctor Sehebe, because you brought up as well. Would you like to maybe add on to that? Yeah, I'll just not uh, re repeat what uh, uh, Tobat said because I think for me it is all about commitment of our leadership. The African leadership has signed and ratified several commitments. Abuja Declaration, 15% to healthcare. Addis Declaration on Immunization. Declarations on research and development on this continent. At the end of the day, the ratification ends in the room, in the beautiful AC room, and that's it. So that commitment, and we know that our leadership changes all the time. The corruption cannot be underestimated. We can hide our heads in the sun, but the, Afri the corruption on this continent cannot allow so many things to happen. Then again, we have competing priorities. 
you're still with cholera. Look at a country like DRC. I'm based in Brazzaville, right across the river from the Democratic Republic of Congo. This country at any one time is fighting at least two outbreaks. It's either cholera with uh, Ebola, with measles outbreak, with yellow fever and COVID. Now, these five coexisted at the same time in one country, a low-income country. You're not forgetting that malaria still exists, HIV is still going on, there are floods here, there's typhoid somewhere, there's, it, uh, the leadership is, is uh, there's uh, elections going on, conflicts going on, insecurity, deaths, and all that, everything goes on. So that instability, the fragility of our healthcare systems, but also the instability of the country systems themselves cannot allow us to get far. But at the end of the day, it's the commitment of the leadership. If they put their priorities straight, we can get this. Thank you. I, I have um, one thing to this. Uh, I, found a, I found an, uh, a great example of one thing that worked. And this is from um, Bowindi Community Hospital in Uganda. Um, so what they did well was they actually listened to the local community and they integrated themselves into the local community without bring in a Western agenda, like all oh, insurance and things like that within, within the system. They try to find if there's something that's similar to what's already been going on and try to rework how they wanna work their um, healthcare system into that. And it worked really well. So they created like an insurance system and they tied it to a local thing that they, in my, in my, in my, um, in my culture, they call it SUSU, which is basically a pool of money that people put together Every single time, most countries have this in, I would say in Africa, or most, most groups. So basically every week, for example, we put in money, like $5, for example, and then someone gets it at the end of whatever that week is. So what they did was they tapped into that system and they said, all right, out of that majority, we'll take 15% and that will cover the, the healthcare for the community. So people are like, okay, it's, it's the total amount of what everyone else is putting. And then they spoke to people who are richer, like, can you put in a little bit more? And then, you know, it was like a voluntary basis. And for them, they saw the insurance system go from like 20% of people insured to like 80 and above. And it was just tapping into an existing structure within the villages. And this is in the villages of Uganda. So, um, and it, it's working for them. Like, it's just, yeah, it, it really, like for them, that's the way that worked within that area. So I think it might be important for local communities to tap into systems that are already working and try to find a way to do a collective system that way and try to integrate that with Western knowledge and data and all of that. But essentially, they need the communities buying for a lot of this stuff to work. Well, that's, that's actually very interesting. And I guess something that maybe one to Africa could even think of. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I would actually just like to remind the audience that we have about 15 minutes left in the discussion. So if anyone does have any questions for our panelists, please just put that in the chat and we'll, we'll ask it uh, right away. But I think um, if there's nothing from the, from the audience right now, I can kind of start another topic of, of discussion here. In, and it, we, we've kind of touched on, on it already, so perhaps we can, we can go quite quickly through this one. But how do we suggest striking a balance between creating a self-sufficient system, which you know is the the goal? I would say uh, is to have a medical system across the continent that is that is rather self-sufficient, but at the same time accepting foreign aid, which can speed up the development of of African communities. At least in in what I've learned with my work with One Day Africa in the last year, I found that that seems to often be another contradiction where accepting foreign aid tends to have a somewhat of a ripple effect where we end up crowding out very African systems. And, you know, Mr. Barry, as you actually just mentioned, in a lot of cases, that's not what should happen. And it results in systems that are not integrated well with the community. So I, I would like to, you know, ask our panelists, how do we mediate these two, these two things between a self-sufficient system and accepting helpful foreign aid? Uh, I, again, I don't, I don't know who would like to go first, but maybe Dr. Atahebwe, if you would, if you'd be so kind. Uh, thanks again, Devon. So the ongoing COVID-19 crisis has really accentuated the need for self-sufficient healthcare systems in most low- and middle-income countries, as well as appreciate the importance of prioritizing investment in healthcare. Look at where we are with vaccine. 
heavily, basically almost 100%, reliant and dependent on the outside, on the, on the Western world. We thought that our fellow middle, low and middle income India <laughs> would be our source of help, but we know what happened in India. So when India closed off their I work in vaccine, so it's easier for me to use as an example, closed off their exportations because of the surge that they had, of course they had, it was understandable, the whole of Africa was basically closed out just because there was no vaccine manufacture on the continent. So the, this is not just foreign aid, it is I was, investment, use of, uh, of relying on foreign everything. We have uh, Pfizer vaccine. We have the US and the Team Europe that have donated to us several and huge doses of vaccines. We have the Pfizer vaccine that comes with a special syringe. We are even asking for syringes. We have the doses, we can't administer them because we need to rely on a foreign service. Well, as healthcare systems are highly context specific, there's no single set of best practices, I would say, that can, we can put forward as a model for improved performance. In fact, uh, many of our low-income countries are still seeking innovative ways of harnessing and focusing the energies of communities. And like Kumar said, by the way, I'm from Uganda, so I know Windy Community Program very, very well. It's, it's one of our star communities. The NGOs and the private sector, bringing all this together to have to you know, synergize those uh, energies. The low-income countries still recognize that there's no guarantee that the poor will benefit from reforms unless these reforms are carefully designed with the end in mind. Governments must approach health system sustainability as a system objective, a whole system, and must turn to financing through progressive, probably taxation of all types of income and comfortable much as and this appears uncomfortable when we talk of increasing taxes on everything, it is a reality not to be overlooked. National health insurance financed through taxation should gain momentum in the quest to win of foreign aid and grow more sustainable and responsive health systems. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Barry, would you maybe care to go next? Yes. Um, so I, I tend to think of it as, um, you know, we don't need foreign aid. We need foreign investments. And those investments have to basically build our capacities. Um, because just thinking about all the actual like things that I've seen as investments, whether it's um, trying to build a local population, build um, factories, or just trying to um, build a capacity of countries is better than giving us. You know, they they tell you is, you know, you could you could give a man a fish, but you know he'll stop the next day. But then if you teach a man how to fish, so I want I think it's important for these foreign governments or foreign entities whether it's corporations, things to teach us how to fish and, and, and so that we can get it ourselves. Um, I think one of the things that I read recently, I think it was in, it was, um, I think it's in Rwanda or is they trying to figure out how to create a factory of development of, of vaccines there. So I think we need that capacity because we can't always sit back and, and rely on other countries to do it for us. And this comes in not only healthcare, but also in, in industries such as mining and food processing and everything. How can we be self-reliable or how can we be sustainable when we rely on um, other, in other countries' generosity to ensure our continuous growth? It's definitely not sustainable. And I think there needs to be um, uh, an increase in an in investment in the private sector. And that's what I think makes you know countries like for example, like the U.S. work, it's the investments in the private sector that that pushes all of these innovations to happen. For example, Moderna, that's a private company. Well, it's run as public, you know, open, but it's still a private company. Uh, Pfizer and all of these companies. What is our governments in Africa doing to subsidize or to increase the ability of its citizens to actually create companies or to help those companies or startups in those countries actually um, expand or build. You know, same thing that China did, which is prop up those companies or same thing that India has done. I'm sure they subsidize a lot of those, for example, that huge um, 
um, companies that generate the vaccines, I'm sure the government helps those run or funds them in a way that makes sense for their countries. So I think, you know, I think the funding, the money talks, like honestly, uh, anything else, you know, anything else that someone says it is the laws are good, but the money helps like the funding, the subsidies and, and enforcements, those things work. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Odomosu, would you like to, to add anything? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, when it comes to, it's, it's, it's a little tricky. Now, uh, for countries who have you know, Indonesia, Japan, you know, there's so many of, of these countries that are you know, well-developed countries now that have at some point in time uh, had to take it from other countries to, to get by. So, and I think that what is important is that there should be an, some sort of exit strategy when you're taking uh, this aid. And I like uh, the way uh, uh, Omar puts it as an investment. So, but I think uh, the problem with AIDS, uh, all these grants and uh, it's when it comes to us here in Africa, is that it seems to make our government, uh, what I call it, lazy, or uh, you have a situation where people now sit down, create health budgets entirely around grants, as though as a functional government, there's someone else who's supposed to bankroll the programs. So, and of course, that's this COVID-19 has exposed the, 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 the flaws of those kind of systems where they're too much integrated into global supply chain. They're not, in fact, the basic research it's difficult for us to do it here on the continent, even if we can do production. And of course, there's so many, it's, it's always a complex problem. Before you can produce certain things, you need petrochemical industry, you need so many things to be going for you before you can even you know, match up with those, uh, some of those things. Of course, which brings into context the issue of leadership and the commitment uh, of our leaders. So uh, there's no way we're going to get out of this without working towards uh, self-sufficiency, but what I also feel is that there's also no way we're going to get out of this without getting some sort of help, which is not bad in itself. But the question then is, how do we ensure that when we're taking this thing, there is an exit strategy that uh, I'm planning towards that, oh, if I take uh, 100 billion this year, I want to take less and less, and I want to see myself getting you know, much more stronger and uh, self-sufficient. Uh, with the kind of population we have on the African continent, if what we're experiencing now happens again, which all the global systems are destabilized. Uh, I didn't think the, the only uh, lock we have this time is that the COVID-19 didn't just have as much devastating effect on the continent. If it had half of what it did in North America, I don't know what we'll be talking about now. I mean, people will just be drop, drop, uh, dropping dead on the, on the, on the roads. Because even the buses that they made available for us, you see the the, the kind of logistic challenge is there, even just the logistic aspect of giving this vaccines. We're not talking about, I mean, we have a, a level of global coordination that was able to deliver a vaccine in that record short time. It has never happened before. And then you have a situation where in our own context, what we need to deal with or we're trying to deal with is the distribution and it's still very, very chaotic and unorganized. So uh, I think uh, that's, that's my opinion. Fantastic. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think we have about four minutes left, and there's maybe one one thing I would like to ask that, that kind of almost leads back into our original discussion around education. Uh, but, you know, as we've ever discussed throughout this, well, as we've seen throughout this discussion, uh, community buy-in is, is key. And a lot of that comes down to, as we mentioned, data that's being presented and, and those sorts of those sorts of things, like, you know, how, how and in particular, how effectively that data is being communicated. But one problem that you know I see a lot, and we've come across at One Day Africa, is that most of the data is not tailored in the African context. We're we're trying to communicate very Western or you know maybe even Eastern data towards an African population, which seems to make it harder to to communicate effectively. So I think the the last topic for for maybe the last few minutes I would I'd like to hear from someone is just the fact that how do we maybe promote more African focused data collection and just research in general. On protecting frontline healthcare workers to to maybe begin to to bridge the gap and and make more effective care for healthcare workers happen on the continent. Um, 
May, Mr. Odomosu, uh, you maybe would like to go first due to your, your kind of work with nurses. Um, but yeah, I, I, if anyone else would like to jump in after, please do go for it. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. So I think uh, what I would say is that uh, from the point of view of uh, the professional association I, I work with, I think uh, health professional groups, health professional associations would uh, be one of the uh, very important tools that uh, uh, private or civil society groups will need to collaborate with because I would want to assume that within such associations and systems, you would have less resistance and then yeah, uh, they can be like a springboard of advocacy, of being able to reach out, uh, like as it has been mentioned, that this is some level of trust that uh, people have of health workers, of nurses, of doctors, uh, and like, and that, that in working with the, their own professional organizations and associations is where we can mount some level of pressure on the government to do the needful in, uh, in certain ways. And then, of course, Many of these associations like my, I also uh, have network embeddedness in terms of other uh, parallel organizations, professional associations that we have links with, that we can sell these ideas to, that we can continue to advocate uh, through these uh, systems uh, and centers that are available to us. And I think uh, that way, one way or the other, we can you know, get the system to, to, to be improved. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Atahewa, Mr. Barry, would you like to comment? Well, in my opinion, lack of research into risks to healthcare workers in Africa can be addressed by engaging the vast academia and health research institutions on the continent who have to fulfill their mandate of providing evidence to influence practice and policy. So they need to integrate inexpensive health facility continuous quality improvement projects that promote ethics and increase uh, healthcare worker trust in research. Contextualized uh, operational research projects that also focus on occupational health and safety education, training, things like supervision, surveillance, and of course monitoring strategies must be developed also and implemented. We need to create a critical mass of researchers and knowledge that can be used to influence policy and practice. And we have the brains on this continent. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Barry? Yeah, I think, I think it is mostly about the infrastructure, whether it's the institutional or the national. Like, what are the guidelines or, or even the continental approach? Like, now I see journals propping up, you know, that are more focused on the African continent, and they're pushing out um, information about, you know, information or, like, evidence coming from Africa, which is a great start. And I think, you know, we have to stay away from or try to convince individuals that it's not the best evidence is not because it's not the best because it's published in a journal, a Western journal, but rather it's because it applies to us. It is our data and it is our scientists, our authors who are publishing this. And then just continuing doing that and ensuring that, you know, there is there is a system of reporting that makes sense for not only within countries, but within the continent overall. Great, thank you. Thank you all for that. And I, I think that brings us to time. So would anyone like to maybe say some final final comments before we we close the um, this panel discussion? No. All right, then, I mean, I, I think all your, your comments there at the end really maybe rounded out our discussion quite well. So I'd like to thank our three panelists again for taking the time. I certainly found this to be a very interesting and enjoyable conversation. Uh, I hope the audience did too. And in particular, I hope we, we get a lot more, you know, views once this, post, once this uh, discussion is put on YouTube so that everyone can, you know, get the, get the same level of insight. Uh, you know, thank you again and uh, go well, everyone. <laughs>